So if you have your bulletin, it's always wonderful to look on the back of the bulletin to see what interesting artwork we have here. And because we're gonna have a speaker today who is an architect, we have an example of some really, what I think, speaking as a lay person who knows absolutely nothing about it, uh, save, I'm trying to cover myself there in he case is talk about Jamie this. gets up later and says, this is, is a terrible example. Okay, good. Well, so yeah, to show you that I know nothing about architecture, but it seems to me a very fascinating piece of work, bringing together the modern and the older together in that way, so you can appreciate that. We have a number of announcements here, so let's cover them very quickly because there are several of them that are coming up here in this very week. So in fact, this very day, after chapel, we're going to have the Seraphim Arts Guild meeting, and that's gonna take place in the art gallery over on the other side of Cullen. Welcome everyone there. You don't have to be interested in becoming an artist, but just have an interest in art, or in this case, architecture, because Jamie Cameron, who will be introduced later to you, who's speaking to us today, will be there, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm definitely gonna be there. Tomorrow is going to be a free pizza lunch, right? And so, is there such thing as a free lunch? Well, apparently the DSA has made it possible. So show up tomorrow for the DSA pizza lunch. The Linguistic Circle will be meeting on not Tuesday, October 10th, but on Thursday, October 10th. Thursday, October 10th, seven o'clock in the boardroom. Some of us will meet around five to go over and eat together. So if you wanna be part of that, come and see us here meeting in Cullen Hall for that. At the bottom, we have the, the um, Center for Church and Culture sponsoring a talk by our own Clement Wen, and that is going to be on Thursday, October 24th. If you're interested in that, you'll want to be a part on discipleship in a new technological era. And then the last announcement I'll make is uh, we're putting together just a very casual, I don't want to call it a conference, but an afternoon of C.S. Lewis, and this is going to take place on Wednesday, December 4th from 1 to 5. It's called Faith, Fantasy, and Philosophy and other good F words that you're allowed to say. And it's an afternoon of C.S. Lewis. So we're gonna, we have a number of speakers who are gonna give some papers on Lewis and we invite you to participate if you want to. There's a call for papers by 1st of November. Let us know if you're interested in Lewis or his circle or anything related to Lewis. Uh, let us know and feel free to come no charge just show up there will be snacks adam barkman from redeemer university will be a part of that conference too so we're looking forward to him being with us if you know of other announcements that should be in our bulletin contact jay yoon or wendy and we'll make sure that they are put into the bulletin and one little update okay that if anybody wants to, if anybody is live stream now and wants to join the art Guild later by live stream, they should contact Daphne, um, who's the person who sends up the MDC events, and she's got a link for you. Okay, very good. So it's possible to join us for that. And as I mentioned earlier, Jamie Cameron, who is an architect, and will be able to set me straight on all the comments that I've made. We'll be speaking a little bit later, but he'll be formally introduced to us by our own James Tugan a little bit later. So let's pray together as we come into God's presence. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to be here together. We're looking forward on this bright, though a little rainy afternoon to a wonderful time in your presence. I pray, Lord, that you would be with our speaker, but also with all of those who guide us and lead us in our worship of you, and we look forward to hearing from you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. A long time ago, I was an architecture student and when I started my after high school education, and the biggest thing I learned from my brief time there was that architecture just might be the ultimate art form. Architects, it's such an eclectic discipline. It involves so many things going on at the same time in design. It in many ranges of aesthetics and design. It also includes sociology and philosophy and politics. Every architect knows there's tons of politics in design. Um, it's just, a 
comprehensive skill set that very few people can manage. Um, an artist like me, I create illusions of three-dimensional depth. Architects are doing the real thing. They are inventing space and taking us through it. They are thinking three-dimensionally. I often tell my high school students who want to be architects that they have to learn how to think and draw volumetrically. They have to imagine three-dimensional space and be able to create it instead of just flat pattern or cartoon. It's a different way of thinking. And one of the things, I mean, this, this has certain really interesting results. Architects connect us with the land. They situate us and plant us in real landscapes. They give us views of those landscapes and they give us a sense of where we belong. Uh, buildings can do that. And <laughs> go through the history of architecture proves this uh, in all different ages. Um, the other thing that they do is that they help us understand interiors and living spaces. When I was in school, all they talked about was not just external context, but also how a, a room like this and the the offices we work in, the factories we work in, the houses that we inhabit, how they affect us. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, they were always talking about the intimate nature of living in a building. Um, and anyone who's been to Chartres in France or Sagrada Familia in Barcelona or the Martin House over here in Buffalo by Frank Lloyd Wright, which is a great trip, by the way, um, or the, the, the new facade, well, it's not new anymore, but the facade of the AGO in Toronto. You, you're made immediately aware that the architects are thinking about every conceivable surface in that structure. It is incredibly detailed and intimate. Now, the, the other thing that architects can do is that they can get us to think about more than that. They can get us to think theologically. Not everyone would say that they can do that, but um, they can get us to think about what we value and what we imagine that we can't see. And that's what you're gonna be hearing about partly today, I think. Um, now, I think our, our, our guest, Jamie Cameron, who I consider a colleague, is uniquely qualified to talk about this because this man loves the Lord, he knows his Bible, he loves the Lord, and he's a really good designer. So I turn it over to you. Whoops. Kind. Uh, this is kind of new to me, um, so I think I'd like to pray. You good with that? Yeah. Father, what a privilege to be able to come before you as your children. Thank you for who you are and this perfect creation that you have caused to be perfectly fallen. And we get to live in that and to glorify you in that and ask that what is said today would be to the praise of your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to read some of this because I'm not good at this. But uh, bear with me. Um, uh, so I'd like to start with a scripture and then a definition. I just did cataract surgery last week, so mind the readers while I get used to all this stuff. So I don't know how I'm going to do what you do. So uh, a scripture, a definition, and some premises that are the foundation, so to speak, of the um, way I build of you towards uh, 
what makes good architecture and how to make good architecture, if that's possible. Uh, I try, and I say try because, uh, you know, James make a point, you know, he's, he owns the canvas and the paint and the paintbrushes. I don't own anything. And, uh, and so architecture is often a concoction of influence, uh, sometimes uh, to, to the good and sometimes not so much. And we'll look at that um, a little later. The scripture that I want to look at um, is, um, sorry, this way. Sorry, uh, I'll get it yet. No, you're going the wrong way, Mr. Cameron. Is this the right way? No, it's not. This would be the right, no, that's the wrong way. No? So if I go this way? Okay, that's backwards. Yeah, okay. And now this is forwards. I thought it was, okay, okay. Yes, we're, we're getting there. So whether you eat or drink, uh, or whatever you do, uh, do all to the glory of God. Now that kind of looks like, a, sounds like a sandals vacation, you know, all inclusive. And um, um, it means that, I mean, if, you, if that verse is true, the way I eat my breakfast can bring glory to God. Yes, whether you eat or you drink. And it means uh, whether I, you know, whatever I do as a vocation can bring uh, glory to God. And that's really um, the chief end of man, right? According to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Um, it is to glorify God. And so the question I've been asking for decades is how can architecture glorify God? Or more specifically, how can my architecture glorify God? And this is kind of what I've come up with. So I'm not asking you to agree with me. Um, uh, I got some premises here you may not buy, and I'm okay with that. Just, you know, just don't cancel me, okay? This, the, the culture du jour says, eh, no, well, don't do that. So, the, and then, so what is the glory of God? And the, the, the definition that I like is that the glory of God can be defined as the radiance of the sum of his perfections. Now, I'm sure all of you guys have got your own, but that's my working definition. So my first premise, and you may, again, may agree with some of these and maybe not. You're allowed to be wrong, okay? The creator is a single being made up of three persons, father, son, and spirit, forming the basis for hierarchy and community. Premise two, his revealed character and his creation can be re reduced to two attributes, truth and grace. These qualities can be expressed architecturally and are most impactful when both are expressed in the same element. Premise three, we share some of God's, eternal, God's attributes so that our internal wiring is configured to find certain elements, experiences, and synergies intrinsically attractive. Fortunately, God wired us for joy. Premise four, his signature permeates all of nature expressed in the gold ratio, ratio and groupings of three. I would suggest there are other signatures, but not applicable to architecture. Premise five, he created heaven and earth out of pure joy, forming the basis for playfulness in architecture. Premise six, his creation is damaged in God's economy. Redemption is better than perfection, forming the basis for rich architectural expression and experience found in renovated spaces. And premise seven, common grace. God bestows universal and undeserved goodness on all of humanity. And a couple of verses that can speak to that. Matthew 5, for all, he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Psalm 145, the Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. The glory of God. This is, it, this is this remarkable experience of Isaiah. Above him stood the seraphim, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We, we read this earlier in Psalm, Psalm 19, the glory of God, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim his handiwork. 
So these verses uh, tell us about create. Um, oh, I got one more. And the Word became flesh and dwelt be, uh, among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So these verses tell us uh, that creation and, and Christ, they both radiate his glory. And I would suggest that just as the incarnate Christ was full of truth and grace, so nature is full of truth and grace. And to clarify that, there are two definitions that I would make. This is the first one, truth and creation, the elements that define an entity. So we could look at that piano and we know it's a piano because its elephant, elements does, uh, um, define it. Um, that's a piano. Everybody knows that's a piano. Um, and then grace and creation, the qualities, and it should be actually, I think it's more accurate to say that the qualities of, of um, well, I got it right, it is entity. The qualities of an entity they, that have a motive impact. So refinement of the second uh, uh, premise would be that uh, architecture that glorifies God is architecture that expresses truth and grace. So in nature, uh, sometimes we find the, and the, the uh, grace and truth in combined elements, and sometimes we find them uh, together. But in a combined element, we could look at um, the Canadian Shield, and then um, the grace of it would be the vegetation that sits on the, on the Canadian Shield, uh, so that we have truth and grace in two different elements seen in nature. The, the, for for um, if, if truth is the expression of the characters, then um, a botanist would find a true description of a flower. That's truth. And a florist, on the other hand, would be, have a primary interest in the beauty of the flower. But the botanist's truth and the florist's grace are the same element. And I think when those things happen in architecture, um, they are the most impactful. It's not always possible, but when it does happen, uh, it's a good thing, which is what we're looking at uh, on the back of your bulletin, which is um, uh, the, the Galleria in Toronto that um, has also been coined the Cathedral of Commerce. Um, and it's not unlike, if you were to put that um, image beside an image of um, Notre Dame, it would be very similar. Um, so this is, this is Santiago Calatrava. He's a Spanish architect. He is quoted as saying, I am not just an architect, I am also an engineer. There is no separation between the artistic and technical aspects of my work. I would say that's truth and grace. He also said that the natural world is the greatest source of inspiration. And the inspiration that he had for this apparently were the tree-lined uh, country lanes in, the, uh, in, uh, in rural Ontario. That's the story anyway. Uh, so, <clears throat> so th this is one of his uh, works. This is not. Uh, this is a train station. The entity, we know what that is. The truth of this entity is that it is a train station. It has tracks. It has a platform. It has a, a, a roof to protect from the sun and rain. It's got some seating, got a kiosk. That's what a train station is. Um, but it is a graceless train station. That could be any train station in most nations, right? I mean, we've all been in train stations that are but ugly, right? We know that. But that's his um, train station in Lisbon, Portugal, uh, where those elements of truth and grace are one piece, and it is a graceful experience, and so I'd rather leave on a train out of that place than Perth, Australia. Um, so, Truth and grace are complementary, but they can get out of balance. Um, you know the axiom, I'm sure you've heard it, truth without grace is brutality, grace without truth is hypocrisy, and that would be true of um, interaction with people, um, but it could also be true of architecture. And um, in the truth corner, weighing in on the heavy side, is brutality. And this is actually called brutalism, it was a style of architecture that went from the 50s to 70s, and its typical characteristics include 
a blocky, heavy appearance, simple graphic lines, lack of ornamentation, utilitarian feel, monochromatic palette, use of raw exposed concrete, rough and finished surfaces, small windows. Uh, if you've ever been to University of Toronto to John Robart's library, it is another example of that, also known as Fort Book, for good reason. It doesn't look much different from that. Um, so, um, yes. Uh, in, the, in the grace corner, weighing in on the fluffy side, uh, is architecture that says one thing and does another. And what better example of hypocrisy in architecture than false front buildings, which were the mainstay of frontier towns, which is, this is Yukon. It was built in 18, whatever, 98. And uh, it, the, 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 the image it's trying to portray is that it's a three-story building with a flat roof, when in fact, it's a two-story building with a slope roof. Um, and lest we think that this is dead and gone, I show the jury Exhibit A. This is a house that was built in the street around 19, 2015 on the street that I used to live in Oakville. And um, bogus windows. Okay, they're blacked out windows, bogus shutters. There's nothing behind those windows but roof trusses. Uh, but great curb appeal. So, you know, if you're building a stage, you know, like a, a movie set, that's a good idea. I, I don't think it's a good idea for architecture. And of course, <laughs> the polar opposite of brutalism is Rococo, where every statement of truth is smothered with grace and not, uh, so, so there's a need for, well, there's a need for balance um, uh, in appropriate proportion of grace and truth. Um, and Jesus obviously was the perfect proportion. Right? So before we get into, I'm going to look at, we're going to look at some of, my, some of my work next, but before we do this, it's a little class participation. Okay, so what I want you to do are the three similar facades, and I would like you to take a look at those, and I want you to make a decision on the next, I'm going to put my Jeopardy theme song on here, um, the next 30 seconds to a minute, which one do you find the most attractive? And I just want you to, don't tell anybody, right? And we'll take up the answers at the end of class. Everybody got there? Okay, that was 30 seconds. You okay? Everybody okay? Anybody need more time? Okay, before we go any further with that, we're going to take up the answers in a minute. Um, I just wanted to look at a couple of signatures of the creator. One is the golden ratio, and I'm sure uh, this is not probably foreign to all of you. It's pr probably pretty, pretty standard stuff, uh, a ratio of 1 to 1.618, um, and it shows up in nature. Uh, it's in the branching pattern of leaves in trees, and uh, it's distribution of, of seeds and raspberries, for instance. And of course, it's the most popular one. That's the Fibonacci um, sequence, which takes, well, it doesn't matter. It's the Nautilus shell is probably the most uh, classic example of, of um, the golem ratio and the Fibonacci sequence in nature. Uh, and the other uh, signature of the creator is threes, the groupings of three that we see throughout uh, creation. And, uh, and obviously the most fundamental grouping of three for an architect is the X, Y, and Z axis. So depth, width, and height. And uh, that's what we work with. The other, <clears throat> um, so space and time are constructs of God that will at one point disappear. The other um, construct time also is in three pieces of past, present, and future. But we can see uh, we can see that animal, mineral, vegetable, liquid, solid, gas, um, you know, the, the heart, the biblical heart described in the, in the great commandment was affection, volition, and cognition, three aspects to that as well. So uh, suffice to say that um, threes are a, and understandably uh, uh, re resonate through creation because God is a community of three, a person of three, three persons. I, I, that's a theological thing you guys can duke out, but um, so back to the three facades. 
So who's, who, by a show of hands, who chose an A? Okay, how many chose B? And how many chose C? Okay, all the A and B folks stay after class. Okay, we got some, we got some work to do. And maybe I wasn't, maybe it wasn't too diverse enough, but C, and this is saying, I don't know how many people here write exams, but here's the gig for, for, for multiple choice. That has got me through some significant exams, including the lead exam, C or the longest answer. That's just a little, you know, if you're, if you're, if you read, if you're taking an exam or writing it, C is the longest answer. So you can see where the, the uh, golden section, the golden ratio shows up in the elements, uh, the door, the, the bay uh, window, that area that's described, uh, implied by uh, the eaves and the steps, um, the vent above, and the, all of the windows have uh, are the golden ratio. And so it's somewhat infested with the golden ratio, That's whereas the others are not. So that was just an example, uh, sort of interesting that we kind of, uh, the majority said yes, which is kind of cool because that's something that is intrinsic. We just, we just, we're, it's, it just looks right. Now as an architect or a designer, you're gonna pick that up more frequently because you're working with it all the time. But, but we just saw that the majority of you, did, you don't do that for a living, but you still got the, the intrinsic um, ratio that resonates through creation. So, this is my stuff. This is uh, Oakville Christian School, and I show you the site plan. I don't think, do I have a pointer on this? Uh, no, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. You can see uh, where the, 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 the um, access is, the entrance, uh, and I show that because uh, this was actually the site plan for site plan approval, but uh, it, it has, um, um, it, they don't have buses, and they got about 300 kids. So it's a logistic working to get people in and out of there. And so they have four lanes, and it, it, it's a very interesting thing to watch. Uh, but in front of it, um, the kids have to line up outside. And so um, the mandate that I was given was uh, they wanted a, a new gym. Because you can see that that's the gym, the big space here. And the grayed out area and the biggest space in that grayed out area and the, on, the, on the left, that was the old gym. And, and so very small, like not even a third of the size. So um, it, it was difficult for them to um, kind of do their thing, uh, preparing for sports and that kind of thing. So, uh, so the mandate was three things, a, a gym with its supporting spaces, a stage, and a, they wanted a place to gather, a gathering place. And so, um, the spaces are, and of course, the, as Kahn would say, Louis Kahn was a famous architect. He's talked about served and serviced, uh, served and serving spaces. So um, the serve space would be the, uh, the gym, obviously. They, they wanted the stage on the gym, uh, which is to the, to the right. Uh, below it is stage left and also field house uh, storage. Above it um, is stage left and um, refuse recycling. And above that in the corner is, is a prep, food prep area, and then the um, socializing area at, at the top, which looked out, looks out onto the, um, uh, the road, but also looks into glass uh, panels into the, uh, to watch whatever's going on in the, in the gymnasium. And then on the other side, a change rooms in the lower left, um, a, a gym office in the middle, and washrooms uh, along the side with a vestibule. Uh, so, um, Oh, there is a pointer? Oh, is that that thing right there? Try that. Look there at go. that. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, so I just described all this stuff, and I'm sure you carried it. God, I got it all. So, uh, yeah, it was all there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so and, and then, but there was also this uh, covered uh, space that I thought, you know, the kids are going to be waiting out there. They need to be nice to be able to cover them. Um, What's next? Okay, same's a little bigger. So this was a presentation a perspective rendering, uh, and you can see that the gym uh, with the stage beyond uh, doors out to the outside. Uh, this uh, was a socializing space. This is a canopy, but I I, I wanted to I wanted the, to have an opportunity to kind of. Uh, 
advertise themselves, for want of a better term, um, to the community uh, and, and have kind of a, a display window, like a store would, so that they could display um, some of the stuff that's going on. So that's what that, this area up here is. And in the presentation, I, I thought, you know, a school of fish um, floating above, it just, so getting back to the premise, playfulness, that, that we could actually do all kinds of things up here. This wall could be washed with any kind of light to create stuff. Uh, the valence and the lights are lowered to, uh, to help with the intimacy of the space. The space works really well. I've actually been to a shower, in the, a wedding shower in that space, um, or baby shower, I don't know. Um, but the idea was, so I thought, why not have this as a, a school art project where all the kids could get balsa and tissue paper and maybe put some lights in them and make their own fish and it could be wonderful. Remember I talked about the concoction of influences? Yeah. Uh, so, and the other thing I thought, well, this is, you know, this is a symbol of the Oakville Christian School. It's a lighthouse and, and they are one block, one building off the lake shore and the, and the lake is quite close to them. Why not um, have some fun, be playful for, I mean, if ever there's an, a, a building that could use playfulness, it would be a Christian school from JK to eight. And so the idea was that we would have, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, the idea was that the waves would keep the kids dry instead of what? And the columns could be buoys and they could be didactic. They could learn that this is port and this is starboard. And, and the lighthouse kind of a thing for, to, to match their logo. And then to tie it in, we could, the rest of the building, we could um, take that idea and put it to the other entrances. Particularly this entrance, because that's where the kids are, the, the JKs. And that didn't get any traction, so surprisingly. Um, so I thought, why don't I encourage that? So this was, I apologize for the quality of the image, but the idea was, and this, I used this in one of my email Christmas cards, um, to take that space and imagine what you could do at Christmas with snowflakes and a Merry Christmas. And again, this could be an, arts, an art class project to do this. Um, yeah. And then I thought, well, okay, I'm, I, I don't get any of that stuff. So I'm, I'm why not at least make the, f the, the facade light and, 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 and sort of speak to light since that's what you're learning about and that's, the, that's your logo and why not make the finishes white? That, that's what we ended up with, uh, which, I mean, it's not the worst looking building in the world, but I think it works better as an office building than a school. Now, I did employ, you know, you can see three, three, the threes are working in there, golden ratio in the windows, the golden ratio in this thing here, you know, I was working with that, uh, and the canopy is well used, um, it actually, I increased the size of the sill so the kids could actually sit on the sill, um, so getting back to paintbrushes and you know, James, be thankful you own everything you work with, okay, I'm just going. Um, that's looking the other way. It actually worked out well in the massing because it kind of starts small and grows big. It, it works well that way. It's, it's accidental, but I'm happy with that. Um, but that was, uh, oh, Christmas school. It was a great project in other regard. It was a wonderful project, great people to work with. It was, it was, it was good. Oh, uh, I don't want to be here yet, do I? I guess I do. How am I doing time-wise? How many, how many more minutes do I have? A few. Yeah, okay, well then this will work. Okay, um, so this is a, a, um, a, a house in the High Park area, at my sister, a friend of my sister's, and um, you know, there's few things more dangerous than a felt pen and a napkin in the hands of an architect. And uh, so, so she, uh, she, she came over to my place last one night with my sister and uh, she's saying, you know, I have this architect I'm working with and he wants to just put, I have this house and I don't like it and I want to make it look better. And I have an architect says, I want to put, the, put a, a porch on the front. He thinks that's kind of fitting because 
because these are their, her neighbors. All those houses are other houses on her street. They're quite lovely. Um, sorry, I'm pointing the wrong way. Hers is not. And it was uh, a banal, it's clearly a, a, um, uh, a, a money grab. So this building here, this used to be their backyard. I don't know how they got away with it, but they were able to build this thing. And you know, I, I guess it's it got the sensitivities of a contractor in the 60s. Um, so, you know, look, that's like a beautiful by putting angel stone on it. You know, uh, and of course the wrought iron railings. Um, the sidewalk is here. The steps start right at the sidewalk. Uh, they were, the wall, they had a little retaining wall that was falling down. Uh, but you can see, the truth of this is, it's a house. We can see that it's a house. It's got walls, it's got windows, a roof, a door. It's even got, you know, it's got stairs. And so it's all truth and graceless. So what we did, we didn't just mess with the facade, we messed with the front because she didn't use that front yard for anything. I mean, really, there wasn't much she could use it for unless she played, I don't know, croquet or something. And so um, you can, well, you can't see because it's, but the, the, the lot line is literally um, right along her back deck and about a foot off her back window of the dining room. Um, and I can take this off and see what you guys are seeing. So, um, so there, there's no backyard. Yeah, you can kind of see it along there. Very little room. Her deck was there. Anyway, what we did was we, we made this generous. We gave it a little forecourt. Instead of having the steps right up the sidewalk, we, we had a, a, a little forecourt to invite the person in. Steps up to um, a more gracious stairs and an outdoor room that um, she actually used quite a bit. Uh, these are dividers that were screens, which allowed for semi-public, semi-private space. I'm a big fan of that because I think semi-public spaces really enhance community. You get a real sense you're not invading, but you're con you're connecting. It's not a it's not a it's a superficial connection, but you're at least connecting. I really think that those spaces have a lot of uh, benefit. So this was the truth. And that's what we ended up with, which is far more gracious. Um, and you can see that we put a, uh, we put a slit window down the stairwell, uh, took out the old but ugly door and put in a glass door with side lights. Lots of you wanted more light into the place and so those both did that. The canopy that was brutal, um, it was replaced with um, exposed joists and glass again. The screens uh, were, have reg vegetation growing on them. Um, so it really was, for me, it, it, it was a good balance of truth and grace. It was interesting, I met a woman who was, uh, you know, I, I did websites for architects, and I went and told her I'd uh, done this place. She said, hey, let's, you know, that was the ugliest house on the street, now it's the nicest. I thought, well, that's a very kind thing to say. It was but ugly, and it was, inc I mean, it's one thing to have a but ugly house and a row of but ugly houses, but when you're like the ugly duckling. Anyway, so that's, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, so whatever you do, um, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God.